Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Ashanti Golar. I am the president of Emerge, the nation's premier organization for recruiting and training Democratic women to run for office. And this is our Women History Month panel celebrating some of the amazing first in our network. We are joined currently by two of our fabulous alums, Gabriela Cazares Kelly, the Pima County Recorder in Arizona, and Council Member Julia Mejia from Boston. And later, we are going to be joined by Irvine, California Council Member Tammy Kim and Virginia Delicate Danica Rome. I am so excited to talk to everyone today, but first, Gabriella, welcome and give an introduction of yourself to everyone watching. Sure. Skuktash, Anya Nyapchugi, Gabriella Casares Kelly, Bismo Ochkup, Amjad. Good day. My name is Gabriella Casares Kelly. I'm from the communities of Bismo and Kup, which are located on the Thanatham Nation, and I am the current Pima County recorder. Uh, it's an office that oversees voter registration, early voting, and document recording for the county. So I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And Councilwoman Mejia. Sí, buenas tardes a todos. Um, my name is Julia Mejia. I'm in Boston City Councilor at large in the city of Boston. I'm an Afro-Latina and I am what they call the one vote wonder. We won our election by one vote, um, um, letting everyone know that everybody matters and when it comes to elections, that we all count. Happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. So I want to dive in a little bit more about the first. I remember when each of you got elected, I was just so excited because you were making history. Gabriella, with you being the first indigenous woman to hold an elected office in, P in Pima, which is huge. And then Julia, as you talked about, the one vote wonder following your race closely, and for you to be the first Afro-Latina immigrant elected to the Boston City Council. So when you all got elected, what did it mean to you to be the first, but of course we like to say not the last, to represent your community and julia let's start with you yeah um it's i think being the first you walk in with such a weight on your shoulders like you have an entire generation that has prayed for you to to be in the space um you have a sense of responsibility but then you also seize that as a moment of opportunity um, and, and learning how to navigate a system that was never really created for someone with so much fiery and sauciness. <laughs> I think being the first um, Afro-Latina um, and bringing a little bit of swag and flavor into the city council has been part of um, causing disruption. And, and I think that we have set the, the path for other women who are just like me to feel comfortable in their own skin and walking into all different halls of power without leaving themselves at the door. Um, uh, and that is what being the first feels like for me. Um, and, and I think that, you know, I, I think about the fact that my mom uh, was undocumented for a period of time. And on September the 24th, 2019, she voted for me in the primary and casting that vote for her daughter who cleaned offices alongside her made that winning and becoming the first even so much more sweeter. I love that, especially when you hear about the moms being able, the parents, just the family being able to vote and help make it all happen. That those are just some of the sweetest stories. And Gabriella, how about you? Oh, I share a similar uh, experience. I think that, uh, you know, there is a tremendous amount of weight and there's a lot of eyes on this this. This position is normally um, kind of obscure. It's usually an obscure office. And for us to have brought so much attention to it because we were talking about things that really matter to the community, um, 
things that people were telling me I shouldn't talk about. So I talk a lot about white supremacy, systemic racism. I talk about um, Arizona is a prison industrial complex because th those are things that are impacting people that I know, my friends and family, my family members. Um, and so when we talk about these things, people are sometimes surprised by them. They're really, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because this is clearly a win for our indigenous communities. It's it's a win for our black and brown communities um, as a whole, people who are progressives, um, who are, are concerned about, about change, immediate change. Um, but I think it's also this retraining and, and this awakening for people who maybe have never considered my perspective before. Um, I'm seeing it even within like, the journalists who contact me um, wanting to have an interview and who don't understand what it means to be indigenous. I'm literally having to have conversations about being indigenous. What's the, the difference between that and being a Native American or First Nations in Canada um, or um, the differences between my tribe and one of the Northern tribes uh, and different things like that. And so it's really interesting and I think it's broadening um, so much. It's, it's really beautiful in a way um, because it's, it's a learning moment. It's a learning opportunity. And um, I think that that's just, uh, it's, it's a tremendous amount of uh, weight, as you say, but a tremendous amount of opportunity. And I think one of the things that I've just really loved is the amount of access my community now has to elected officials and others um, within my realm, uh, which I think is really amazing. I love how both of you really talked about just showing up as your authentic self, which is just so needed. And I want to bring into the conversation Tammy Kim, Irvine Vice Mayor from California, who is the first woman of East Asian descent on the Irvine City Council. So another first, that's why this is the first panel. Vice Mayor, welcome. Thank you for having me here. So definitely wanna continue on with our conversation. And we know that women continue to break barriers in 2020. And Gabriella, you talked about a lot of the education that you had to do because people were just not familiar with indigenous communities. Julia, you talked a lot about the Afro-Latina and what people actually perceive to be Latina. So when it comes to continuing to break barriers, what are some of the things that you all think that we need to continue to do to show people that you can run talking about white supremacy, racism, equal pay, and get elected like you all did. And Vice Mayor, want to bring you in. What do you have to say to that? Because, you know, you, you have to deal with stuff too. I do. I have to deal with stuff a lot of time. And, you know, the amount of, especially after being elected, the amount of, um, you know, negative emails um, and letters that you receive saying, you know, you're, you know, when you challenge uh, white supremacy and you challenge the institutions of white supremacy and the systems of white supremacy and, uh, you know, for the Asian American community, um, you know, when you challenge our role, our individual roles in the system of white supremacy, um, you get a lot of like hate mail. <laughs> you get a lot of haters, but you get a lot of people that actually support you. So, you know, I, I think my election was really, you know, calling out the systemic injustice and calling it out for what it is and not it unabashedly, um, um, uh, like talking about you know, for example, anti-blackness within the Asian American community, or how as people of color, we need to uh, stay together and not allow ourselves to be wedged against other people of color. And, but I think, you know, as 
as strong as that message is and that the language that I'm using is, it needs to be said. And I think there's a certain sense of authenticity that people recognize with that because it hasn't been said. You don't hear many politicians politicians, um, maybe because I'm not a politician, <laughs> maybe that was the problem, <laughs> um, you know, really, really talking about these types of things. Mm -hmm. So. And then Julia, I know when I asked the question, you were ready to go. So yeah, I was so <laughs> ready to go. You know, it's so funny because when I, um, in my early stages of my campaign, everyone was like, well, just, why can't you just be the first Latina? Why do you have to add Afro Latina to it? Because um, that's going to confuse people, you know. That's and I said, well, they can Google it because I'm going to claim my black roots. Period. Um, then they were like, well, why are you going to lead with being a single mother? You know, there are going to be people who are going to judge you about being a single mother. Why does that have anything to do with you running for office? Why do you have to wear your single motherhood on a badge? You know. Um, why are you talking about immigrant, like leading, like every every label that I like so deeply am proud of, right? Everyone said, leave it at the door. Um, and I said, no, I'm gonna walk into every single place and every single space as I am, claiming all of these things and calling things out. I would be in um, white dominated neighborhoods still talking about black and brown lives, right? Talking uplifting the issues. I never pandered to a particular group just in the, in the, in the you know, with the guys who trying to get votes, even when I was in front of Latinos, right? When they asked me, my first um, public appearance was February the 4th, 2019. I'll never forget the day I had to talk in public about being a candidate. And it was a room full of Latinos. And you would think, because I was Latinx, that I'd be really comfortable in that space. The question that they asked the candidates, because it was a, Latino, a Latinx candidate forum, and they were, everyone was Latinx, is what we're going to do for the Latin community. And you know, everybody had their answers. And I said, I'm not gonna do anything for the Latin community that I'm not gonna do for my other BIPOC family members, you know. Um, I'm gonna deep I'm gonna be centered on all means all because that's my mission in life. Um, and I didn't even let that space divide um, me in terms of the 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 who and how I was gonna show up. And I think that that is when you when you when you're true to who you are and what your values are and you run unapologetic with those things, then you have no problem calling anyone out. In fact, those hate mails and voicemails that you got, my first term in office Actually, like three weeks in after being elected, I got a, a hateful voicemail from someone who thought it was okay to tell me to go back to my where I came from, that my mom was a criminal um, because she was undocumented for a period of time, all of this. And instead of calling him out, I called him in. And everybody said, don't do anything, let it go. But the problem is, is that when we let people do things to us, then what we're doing is enabling them to continue to disregard us. So I stood up. And I stood up to him and I put him in, in nicely. I called him in and he, he called to apologize afterwards. No one expected me to put his voicemail out into the universe, but he got to hear the hate that he was spitting out. And I covered all of the hateful messages with beautiful images of me and my mom and civil rights um, advocacy. And I recycled that energy and I turned it into something positive. And that's what we have to do in, in every space that we walk into is recycle that energy, but stand firm in our convictions and don't let anyone try to take us down because we're here for all of it. Love it. And Gabriella, definitely want to get you in on this conversation and especially want to talk about the fact that our indigenous sisters are also still heavily represented. Of course, we are celebrating Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, <laughs> Indigenous Cabinet Secretary, also our Emerge sister. We are all just so proud of her. But what do we need to do to make sure that we're getting more Devs, more Sharices, more Gabriellas? Because <laughs> we need you. We need all of you. Well, first of all, oh my gosh, um, Auntie Deb Holland, uh, that that entire that entire uh, movement there is just it just it really fills me with so much joy um, and it's so much excitement. I can't tell you how 
much Indian country is celebrating that win. That is, it's tremendous. Um, over and over and over, what I am in, in, encountering is, um, and I really hate to use the word uh, minority because we're the majority now, um, <laughs> but to be in spaces where I am, um, you know, the minority of the minorities uh, is, is something that's very uh, frequent. That happens to me a lot. And um, I'm hit with microaggressions. I'm hit with stereotypes, um, with people not understanding um, some of the different issues. I, I have really ridiculous uh, comments made at me all the time. And over and over and over, I'm having to uh, justify that I belong in these spaces um, and that Native women belong in these spaces um, and constantly um, encouraging people to really call out the white supremacy that inevitably exists in your organization. Whatever organization that is, whether that be academia, politics, government, there is white supremacy there. And until we address that, um, we are not going to have more representation like me. Um, it is a challenge to be in those spaces and to constantly be dehumanized um, or tokenized um, or otherized, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, and again, um, really sharing, I, I really um, empathize with uh, Councilwoman uh, Meha. I was also told I needed to tone down the native uh, because I talked so much about native communities. Actually, it became kind of a mantra for me and I'll actually share um, we put out this imagery, indigenous woman coming through. Um, we're going to come through no matter what, uh, whether or not you're ready for us, uh, whether or not, uh, you, you, you want to engage in this conversation. We're just going to keep coming through. We belong everywhere, everywhere there's decision-making, uh, happening. And so, um, I think for, um, for others who are looking to engage, spend some time learning um, about our communities follow you know not just not just the negative things I don't I don't want people to only focus on um, the bad things the the plight of the Native American um, I want you to also look at the ways that we celebrate ourselves look at our native journalists our native actors our native artists, musicians, like we have so many great things to offer and start familiarizing yourself. Follow um, influencers on social media. We are 21st century natives and people somehow are kind of, oh, we are, oh, I thought you were gone. <laughs> um, but, you know, we're very much here. We're very much in the present and we're very much in the future. So um, I think, all of that type of uh, actions and supporting of Native women, um, you know, it's gonna go a long way. And I'm one of those people, there are so many great Native groups to follow on social media. It is amazing. So everyone just do your Googling, do your Twitter search and find them because they exist. And Councilwoman Mejia, I wanna go back to you since Ayanna Presley first got elected to the Boston City Council, we saw a huge transformation where it has become majority women, people of color. That transformation took a long time, but can you tell us how that transformation has impacted the city of Boston and in particular, the legislation that you all are able to pass. I mean, love social media, love following everything that happens in Boston. And it's great just knowing that it happens because you all are bringing your lived experience to the table. So can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Yes, well, you know, um, the seat that I'm in, the office that I actually occupy right now is the office that Congresswoman Ayanna Presley once occupied. So she was the first African-American woman to represent on the council and went on to become the first African-American woman to represent us in the uh, um, in, in Congress. So to follow her footsteps and to sit in, in, in this office 10 years later as the first um, Afro-Latina, um, it is heartwarming, but it's also just as challenging um, in terms of the, the political 
climate here in the city of Boston in particular. It's it's a city that is uh, has its history around racial um, unrest, if you will. Uh, but it's also really inspiring to lead alongside so many other women of color who are literally changing the conversation because of our lived experience and because of the representation and because of what we go through when we're in public hearings we always ask different questions that bring us in a whole different direction, right? Um, and I think that's because when you're living it, you you have a different sense of sensibility. And I think that that definitely helps in, in terms of the advocacy. You know, a few, a month or so ago, there was a murder right, right literally, I would say at my doorstep, right across the street from where I live. Um, and being an elected official who, who lives in the city of Boston, you know, I'm always, I'm the first person to bring everyone into the conversation and, and call it out. Uh, I think that when you're living these realities and you're experiencing it alongside your constituents, the sense of urgency that you bring into the chamber, the same, well, now the virtual Zooms, um, uh, changes everything. And, and I think that, that representation now, uh, you have you've been able to see on the council the different types of things that we're fighting for, whether it be residential at home kitchens for um, for folks who we know are cooking at home, and what we're trying to do now is uh, is make it legal for people to do so, right? Because we know what it's like when our aunties make the best cakes um, and cookies. We want to remove that barrier so that they can make a living off of that, right? We know what it's like to sit in under-resourced schools. So when the Boston Public Schools come in through their public hearings, I am I'm a BPS graduate. You know, I have a question for everything because my daughter's a BPS now. She's a a, a Boston Public School student, right? So for me. All of those things inform my thinking and it's inspiring to see the change. But I think that, you know, I love Gabriella talking about the whole idea of not calling ourselves minor. There's minorities, there's nothing minor about us, right? That whole situation, we need to start leading with asset based um, descriptors when we're talking about people of color. Like we even set a resolution that when you're going to talk about us, you're going to lead with our assets not just showcase all of our deficits, right? So I think those are the sort of things that change when women are in positions of power because we get to decide how we're gonna do business moving forward. And that is because we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And so we're going there, rolling up our sleeves and calling it all out and that's it, period. <laughs> Love it, so powerful. And I wanna bring in to the conversation someone who is definitely an asset to the Virginia State Legislature. We're going to bring in our Emerge sister, Danica Rome from Virginia, who was the first open transgender woman elected to a state legislature. Danica, welcome. Thank you so much, Ashanti. It's wonderful to see you and to all the other elected ladies on this, phone, on this call today. It's so great to see all of you. Oh, we are so excited you are here. And of course, we got to bring you right into the conversation. Just tell us what made you decide to run for office and what was it like that night you made history? Like I've, I've seen the photos, but I've never even asked you, what was the feeling knowing that you became a first, not only in Virginia, but in our nation? Well, you know, the reason that I ran for first place, the reason that I was in a position to, you know, make history is to serve my lifelong home community here in Western Prince William County, you know, of the greater Manassas area. And to me, in that, 20, that 2017 race, I know that, you know, it, from the I knew there was going to be a lot of media attention for, you know, a trans woman running against the author of the bathroom bill and, you know, the, uh, you know, like the constitutional amendment being marriage quality and all the rest. But at the same time, when you're knocking on doors and you're asking people what issues are important to them, none of them are saying to you, you know, Danica, I can't wait for you to make history. No, they're saying like my commute sucks. <laughs> you know, they're, my child needs health care or, you know, the, the cost of childcare is as much as the second mortgage. 
people have real concerns and they want to know what are you going to bring to the table that's different from what's already there? What are you going to do that's going to be different to make sure that people are taken care of? And one of the great things about when women run is that the position, you know, the worldview that we bring to the table is inherently different than 73 year old conservative men who have been in office for 26 years. And like we are focused on a lot of bread and butter issues. Like for me, I've introduced now, you know, the General Assembly has now passed and the governor has signed into law eight of my bills to fundamentally transform how we do school meals so that every child in the Commonwealth of Virginia at every public school in the Commonwealth of Virginia is guaranteed a hot breakfast and a hot lunch without being shamed for carrying school meal debt. And we are also now having the, uh, we're all now requiring enrollment of all eligible schools in the federal after school meals program that serves 900, more than 900 different schools, but only 30% uh, of them are actually participating. So when we're actually bringing these, you know, table, you know, these ideas to the table, that's transformative, that's transformative. But what was I campaigning on? What, what was my motive, my motive in 2017? Well, my delegate was more concerned about where I go to the bathroom than how his constituents got to work. And so I made fixing Route 28 my number one priority, and now my plan to do it is done. And we're just tracking down the money to go get it done. Um, and that night in 2017, you know, I got, I was at one party in uh, Gainesville, and the numbers came in so fast that I was just, it, it caught me by surprise. But um, later that night, uh, well, actually, the first thing that happened there is um, I got the phone call from now President Biden telling me that, you know, that I won. And uh, that's usually the, the point where you can declare victory, <laughs> you know, with the, uh, then former vice president and future president, you know, tells you that, that you've won your race. But uh, so I walked into the room and I just kind of swung my hands a couple of times. And I said, hey, hey, Joe Biden just called. We won. And that was my victory speech. And um, then I went to a separate uh, party after that. And the first person in the parking lot that I saw after I got on my car was a 10 year old trans girl who had been, you know, like been active in the campaign since the beginning. And she had come up all the way four hours from Roanoke you know, to be there on election day. And I picked her up. I looked her in the eye and I told her, Claire, honey, you can be president. You can be whatever you want to be because we just won this race. And, you know, I want trans kids across the country right now, especially trans girls who are watching this, to know that as horrible as the national climate is and as terrible as so many elected officials who are sworn to protect you and to serve you, and they're not doing it right now, how horrible they're being toward you, that the fact that I'm in office, the fact that about almost 30 people who like us who are in office right now, and all of our cis and straight allies all across the country, including people who are on this call right now, they all support us. And in, here in Virginia, we now welcome you because of who you are, not despite it. Yes. Oh, my God. Yes. I'm sorry I to get off your moderation chair here, but oh, my God. Yes to all of that. Thank you. So beautiful, Danica. And for some reason, I was just called to like ask you that question about like that night, because I always felt that there was more to it. And just to know it is just, oh, I'm, I'm having all the feelings trying to keep it together right now. But I want to go to Vice Mayor Kim. Uh, we do have to talk about the uptick in violence against the Asian community. The country is still reeling from the killings in Atlanta, which included six Asian women. How do we, everyone who's watching this panel, our communities, stand in solidarity with the Asian community during this time? Uh, yeah, I, you know, that whole situation with the Atlanta shooting was really a culmination of a lot of things even prior to that in the the uptick in anti-Asian hate uh, and blame um, as a result of COVID and really the perpetual foreigner status that our community faces. You know, we're told back constantly to go back to where we came from and, um, you know, I, I also got the voicemails of go back to where you came from while I was on the campaign trail, uh, telling me to go back to China, telling me to go back to North Korea or wherever it is I'm from. Um, and council member, I wish I would have done what you did with those voicemails. 
<laughs> I think I still have one of the voicemails. Um, you know, just use it for positive, uh, you know, positive uh, storytelling. But at any rate, um, so the perpetual foreigner status is definitely been something that has been ongoing. Clearly with the the Atlanta shooting, you know, fast forwarding to that really was a culmination of not only you've got racism combined with misogyny and all of that. And it, it goes on this like this hypersexualization um, of Asian women throughout um, the history of this country. I mean, dating back to 1875 with the page laws that wouldn't allow Asian women to come into this country because we were viewed as prostitutes. So even from then, combined with um, U.S. imperialistic actions throughout Japan, uh, Korea, Vietnam, Laos, and all of these countries where we are viewed as it's okay to kill us. It's okay because we're just the faceless enemy. Um, and our women are prostitutes and, and you know, whatever whatever stereotypes people hold. And so when I watched the press conference of the um, the Georgia Sheriff's Department basically saying that they're not looking at this as a hate crime, that he was just having a bad day. That's when my bad day began. Mm -hmm. Like I was having a bad day. Um, and, you know, since then I've been like very, very vocal um, when it comes to the hypersexualization and talking about that of Asian women. And we have to bring that and, and you know, is Emerge Sisters, um, that is the ask that I have is, you know, standing with us because it's a woman's issue at the end of the day. So it's not just in, uh, you know, Asian women, but it's really the, the, the fetidization of all women of color. It has been ongoing since, you know, I know with Native Americans, you know, that history and the black history and Latino, like it, it crosses all of us. And it's realizing, you know, the, the systems that are in place and challenging, challenging that, challenging the media and making sure that, you know, we're not going to be, um, you know, put in this role where we are in this like hyper-sexualized or dragon lady. I mean, you, you name it. And that is the stereotype that Asian women have. Uh, subservient. I can tell you, I am not subservient. Um, and so I am like the least subservient <laughs> woman you will ever meet. Um, but you know, we, we have to just, we have to all work together to, to challenge that. And, you know, it also goes to the, the masculinity of our men, to the model minority myth, to everything that has basically destroyed us, um, it, it, you know, it, as it relates to COVID and really the pit, it has pitted us against other people of color. And it's the, the, institu the white institutions and white supremacy that has helped pit us against one another. Um, and we have to stop that because we were all in the same boat. That's right. Um, and making sure that we are just all cognizant and not letting ourselves be divided. So I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> or else I can just go on and on. So thank you so much, Vice Mayor and everyone. What you're just seeing the support amongst the women, that's the Emerge Sisterhood. I tell everyone it is one of my favorite parts of being involved in this network. So for the next question, I do want to talk about one of our Emerge 2035 goals, which is lift as you climb. Mm -hmm. How our Emerge alums, when they're ready for office, when they're in elected office, how you are inspiring other women to run for office in the Emerge network, outside the 
Immersion at Work and Delicate Rome, I want to start with you because I know that there's so many women in the Immersion at Work, such as like Brianna Titone in Colorado, who said you inspired them to run for office. They saw you do it, that they knew they could do it, and you were super supportive. You embodied that lift as you climb. So we just love to hear from each of you, like how do we show people that that culture exists, that it is real amongst women, especially for the women who are watching who may be on the fence about running for office and think that they may not have support from women who want to see them at the table with them. So to start with that, <laughs> any time any Democratic woman reaches out to me with an inkling of, you know, I think I'm interested in running for office. Do you have any tips? Do you have any ideas? Do you have this or this or this? I always tell them, go through your state chapter of Emerge. I, that's the first thing that I tell them. If they are LGBTQ women, I also tell them to go through the Victory Institute's candidate campaign training program as well. And Brianna did both of those things. Um, sorry, my cat. Bila has joined us today. Um, so we, uh, come on, come here. So in Brianna's case, it was fun because she reached out to me right after the 2017 election. And she said, I never knew people like us could win. What can, what should I do? And so I told her to go through the uh, Victory Institute's training program. And she did. And I told her to go through the Emerge uh, program. And she did in Colorado. And then what'd she do? She flipped a seat red to blue. And she, in the closest election of that entire year, where no one was counting on her to win. It was so hard and she had to hustle so much and she did the impossible. And then she won re-election in 2020 by an even larger margin than she won her first race, which basically goes to show that not only is she viable, but she's done a good job. And that's one of the things that I also like highlighting here is that once our Emerge alumni actually, you know, earn election in the first place, look at what we get done. Look at what we accomplish and how our diversity of worldviews and our diversity of talent is so reflective of not only the ideas from our communities, but the untapped potential that we are actually bringing into office with us in the first place, mm -hmm. where we are actually seeing people succeed on issues that they didn't necessarily expect us to get done. And in 2017, when 11 of our 15, uh, you know, red to blue uh, freshman candidate or, you know, freshman uh, Democratic delegates were, uh, you know, basically took over, 11 of us were Democratic women and nine of us had gone through Emerge. And what happened within f four months of us getting sworn in? We expanded Medicaid to what is now 533 thousand Virginians who were not left uninsured during a pandemic. That's what we're getting done. So, you know, like I'm so proud of not only, you know, the work that we've done, but look who's running statewide in Virginia right now. You have Jennifer Carol Foy, who's a, who went to the same merge class I did in 2017. You have Hala Yala, who went to emerge, you know, before we did. And I had been trying to get Shannon Taylor to to run for attorney general, and she just went through a merge last year as well. Um, and she was actually part of the Virginia Farm team before that, so she's been you know in the network a long time. And I love to just see the talent that our merge alumni you know get to you know you know get to show to people all across America because this is true. The sisterhood is real, and it is the best friends that I have made in the general assembly are my merch sisters, bar none, just, you know, straight up. Yeah, I love seeing the photos of y'all on the floor, just getting things done when you celebrate. Gabriella, would love to hear from you. Uh, my advice for any woman who's wanting to get involved is show up. Uh, just show up. You don't need anything special to go. Um, and and get started and learn and question. Um, I, you know, I used to be a person who was just registering voters, or I was I would you know sit in the back of a room 
um, and hear something kind of funky and I'd be like, wait, what? Can you explain that to me again? Um, and, and, and that was uh, who I was, uh, just showing up to, to places, meeting people. And it allowed me to meet a lot of um, state representatives, legislators, um, elected officials. And sometimes I would have these one-on-one -on -one conversations and I'd be like, this person doesn't know more than I do. This person has no idea what I'm talking about right now. Mm -hmm. This person only cares about votes and does not care about community. And I think as women, you know, we tend to discredit ourselves. Like there's that saying that if um, there are 10 requirements for a job, women will not apply for it unless they meet all 10, but a man will, um, will fill out the same application if, if he has just one, one qualification. And I think that we need to have the audacity of men. Uh, we need to um, have the audacity to put ourselves into these places and, and speak up and, and, and question. And I think that that's really powerful and continue to be ourselves and talk about the issues that are really impacting us. You know, if, if you have some, some badge of honor, uh, like, you know, single motherhood or, or, you know, growing up in poverty or being somehow othered. Um, that is exactly why you belong. And that's why you're needed because you have that. If you have, you know, some, some dark past or some, uh, something in your closet that you're concerned about, that is exactly why you need to be a part of this because it is impacting women like us, like women, everyday women. And so um, show up, have the audacity and be yourself and just continue to do that and see where it takes you. Julia, what do you have to say? Yeah, so, you know, I, I couldn't wait for my turn. I was like, oh my God, yes. Um, Cause I'm the Merge alum of 2019 and you know, I was, I've always will be rough around the edges and my Emerge sister says don't ever trim any of them. Um, and being in that sisterhood during, I, I, my race was an uphill battle in many ways, but to have my sisters there um, during the training, during those six months, to know that I, they always had my back. I mean, I learned about composting. I learned about like, instead of a water bottle to, to carry, um, a, a real water bottle instead of like the plastic ones. Like, you know, I didn't grow up with all of that sort of stuff, right? And so my Emerge sisters were so diverse and so were their experiences that I was able to learn so much from them, right? Um, and those little bits of nuggets, I was able to bring them to the campaign trail. Like I would walk around with a bottle. So I was like climate friendly now, like, you know, I'm all hood. And, but my sisters really just like embraced me and, um, and they they held me down. They, I mean, like, so you need that network. You need you need that sisterhood. And you know, if, if there's any advice that I can give women, I mean, one of the things that we've done now is that we are building the bench. I always said that I didn't want to be the first, and you know, and the last. Like, I really wanted to create a space for other people of color to be able to run their campaign. So we created what we call the political lab. And um, we're doing this specifically, it's a compliment to Emerge, but we're working with um, a hyper, we're hoping Nina and I can sit down and talk about once they go through the Emerge program that we can double in on like what it's like to be a woman of color and having to ask for money because we have that, you know, I got this, no, I don't need nobody's help syndrome or that we, you know, we, we, we hold it down anyways. But that, and that in our communities, people's relationships with money is different. Um, and, and so, I'm hoping, Ashanti, that you can, you know, help us cultivate some of this because the political lab is geared towards uh, working with people of color in particular to step into their power. And it's not just running for office, it's also campaign managers and volunteers because here's what's happening, and especially what I've seen in my community. Our campaign office, we offered childcare uh, when we were campaigning because as a single mom, I know how difficult it was for me to always be engaged. So we offered that as a way, as a, as a way to remove those barriers to engagement. So for us, it's being really intentional about the, the recruitment of volunteers. And so feeding them, providing childcare, all of those things are, are important. Um, and, and so for us, we, we want to like, 
educate people about the power of volunteering um, because that is, we need people to hit those phones. And so teaching people, you might think it's a, a lot of people take that as, as for granted because that's just part of their culture. But when you're juggling to make your ends meet and you're dodging bullets every day, you don't have time to go phone bank for somebody. You're phone banking for where you're gonna pay off your rent, right? So really being super mindful of what that looks like when you're tapping into a community that's already tapped. Um, and, and also women in particular, when we're the heads of households, uh, you know, we, we have to juggle it all. And so being super mindful of like what that looks like. And so those are the sort of things that we've been talking about lifting when we climb. And then I'll say one last thing is tomorrow we're hosting our women empowerment um, fundraiser for my campaign. And I didn't want to do a, a fundraiser where it was just me, blah, 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 right? So we created this whole experience. We are gonna, we're profiling other women doing dope things in the city of Boston around different issues. And we're giving them the spotlight. And we're creating a space for them to share their work, to give um, people an opportunity to figure out how they can be supported, right? It's, we're focusing on black maternal health, um, women in the arts, uh, young people, and women in small business and enterprises, right? And so being intentional about the spaces that we create, it's about lifting while you're climbing. And it's really about stepping to the side so that you can let other people lead. That is what the work is all about. Because even in, even in our appointed positions or elected, we need to recognize that it's not about us. It's about us really being able to bring more people into that space. And that requires sometimes putting your ego in check because ego means easing God out. And oftentimes there are a lot of folks out here who have such a big ego that nobody else fits in the door. So I, I don't know why I'm going off on that rant, but I think somebody who's listening must be thinking that I'm crazy, but I just wanna just throw that out there that women tend to be workhorses and not show horses. And um, I guess Elizabeth Warren said that to somebody and then somebody said that to me because as women, we minimize our impact. Um, and I think to Gabriella's point, I, or uh, it might have been Tammy who, who mentioned it, but that um, men could apply for, with one skill, they, they have it. And women, we're holding it down and we don't see ourselves as, as powerful. And we need to acknowledge that we have that imposter syndrome embrace it, deal with it, and keep it moving because we, we can't play small. These times require us to go big or stay at home. That's right, go big, I love it. And then Tammy, what would you like to add? Yeah, so, you know, Gabriella really hit upon what kept me from running, which was, I'm divorced, I'm a single mom, blah, 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 blah. I don't come from a, you know, great family with, you know, I didn't go to Harvard. I didn't go <laughs> like every reason in the book of why I shouldn't run. And, you know, somebody was like, girl, you, you're, you need to run. You're exactly who needs to run and really told me about emerge. Um, and then that was a coincidence. And then coincidentally, um, Farrah Khan, who is now mayor for the city of Irvine and the first woman of color ever elected, had an eMERGE recruitment salon at her house. Um, and so it it sort of all happened at the same time. And I went there and, you know, Farrah's like, you've got to do this. Uh, give it a give it a shot. Um, so I'm, you know, eMERGE uh, class of 2019 as well. And, uh, you know, but really the, the sisterhood gave me the strength and confidence to be able to run. Mm -hmm. um, it really did because I did not think that, again, I was qualified enough. You, you just name it. There was every reason why I wasn't good enough. Um, and then, yes, to Julia's point, imposter syndrome is real. Uh, especially when you actually win. <laughs> and so that's, <laughs> that's, and, but it was really the, the eMERGE training, the sisterhood um, that gave me the, the ability and the comfort 
to do it and the confidence to do it and to make it happen. And I did it and I blew it out of the park, which was great with all of, you know, the training. And really, you know, one of the things I did when I was elected is appoint nearly all people of color as commissioners. Um, I mean, and that's what you have to do because there's still like my job now, and I obviously it's to serve my residents, but it's to help uplift and to help build that pipeline now. Now, not only am I part of the pipeline for other things, but I am now responsible for building that pipeline. And I take that role very seriously. Mm -hmm. In the state of California, where we have like the largest Asian American population in the country, we still do not have a democratic female in the state legislature. Think about that. Just wrap your head around that one. Mm -hmm. um, still, we haven't had one in the past nearly 20 years. So we still have a lot of work to do. But again, it's, it's you know, I'm part of a pipeline, but I'm building a pipeline. And I'm so grateful for that. And I recognize my role and I embrace it like beyond belief. Um, uh, and, and I'm just enthused about it, so. I love it. I'm part of a pipeline, but I'm building a pipeline. I just, oh, I love Emerge Women. Just so badass. So it's Women's History Month. And I do want to give everyone the opportunity to talk about a woman who has been influential in your life or a woman that you would like to lift up. And Danica, we'll start with you. Um, a woman I want to lift up is actually someone who's no longer among us, but who Virginia is going to be honoring and who we voted to honor in the Virginia General Assembly this year, and that's Barbara Johns. Um, Barbara Johns, uh, for those who don't know, was a teenager in high school in the segregated Jim Crow South in Southside Virginia, who led a student walkout to protest conditions at the all black school compared to the all white schools you know, in the area. And her protest as a teenager, as a black girl in the South, rebelling against the entire establishment to protest everything that was wrong with separate is inherently unequal, ended up being, her, she ended up getting her case rolled into the Board versus Brown, uh, Brown versus Board of Education case that ended up, you know, integrating schools. And in Virginia this year, we voted to remove our statue in King, in statutory hall over in Congress of Robert E. Lee and replace it with a black girl who is the emblem of student activism and why student activism matters and why your voice as a young person matters. We have a statue of Barbara Johns um, on the walk over to the governor's office and you can see her and it said sometimes it felt like she was reaching for the moon she was reaching for the stars because it, it was just what she was after was so far away and so hard her family was literally chased after town out of town after she was successful and that was one of the questions that came up which was well why are we honoring someone who left virginia right it's like she didn't leave by choice <laughs> she was she left to flee for her safety but that was the sacrifice she was willing to make as a girl as a 16 year old and i want to mention her because not enough people know her story when we talk about political activism when we talk about what it actually means to be bold to be courageous and to put everything on the line imagine being someone who is already stigmatized, who is already marginalized, who is already at the most severe disadvantage that you can have, and you still find the courage to project your voice, mm -hmm. to take on the bird machine and everything that came with that, and to completely uproot, upend, and transform the educational system of the United States and race relations in the United States. A black girl in Virginia got that done. She led on that. And that means that all of us can have the courage 
to summon that spirit of Barbara Johns when we decide to run for office or when we decide to make change, when we decide to get out of our comfort zone and we decide to lead. Right. Julia, keep it in line with your fundraiser that you're doing. Who, who do you want to lift up or who's been influential? Yes. Um, you know, I always talk about a woman named uh, Liz Walker. She um, was the first African-American news anchor in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and she shared her story at my high school. I was almost 20 by the time I graduated, y'all. So thank God MCAS wasn't around. I'd still be in high school right now. But she went to my school just to talk about what life was like for her. And let me just tell you that those 20 minutes that she spent in that auditorium talking about her experience inspired me to become the first person in my family to graduate high school and college. And she interrupted my entire cycle of poverty. And I always say that I would not be here today in this role, in any position, had it not been for that moment in time that she just took time of her out of her schedule to speak at my school. And I saw her years later, um, and I was, I had already grad, you know, I had a little gray suit on and a hot pink tunic. I'm a storyteller, sorry, I'll be really quick. I, I, she was gonna be a, a, a keynote speaker at an event. And I remembered I walked up to her and I was a professional then. Um, and I said to her, you know, I would not be in this, in this space right now had it not been for you sharing your story at my high school, um, talking about what life was like for you. You got me into this room. And you got me into every space that I've been in because if it wouldn't have been for that moment that you took to share your story, I would not be here. And I always tell that story because we just never know the impact that we're going to make and the difference that we can make in somebody's life just by telling your story. And so I, I always bring her into every room that I'm in because she opened up that door for me to walk into that room to get with without her even realizing it. Um, I think she's gonna probably put a restraining order at me at some point because I always chase her down when I see her. Um, but I, I'm telling you like that moment and, and she continues to work so hard here in, in Boston and does a lot of work in the trauma space. So I continue to uplift her because she has stayed true to, to the work. Um, so I lift her up everywhere that I go because she lifted me out of poverty. So powerful, Gabriella. Oof. Um, I, throughout my campaign, uh, really drew on the strength of my grandmother. Um, her name was Catherine Host Maria. And um, it was actually, um, once I started doing voter registration out in the community, I recognized um, that there was a lot of systemic barriers uh, to registering people to vote and to part, you know, participating in voting. And so I started doing research and, you know, there had been a lot of conversation about the um, the 19th Amendment and women having the right to vote. And, uh, you know, 20, 2020, the centennial was coming up and it was a really big deal, of course. Um, but I started thinking about it on a personal level. And, you know, my grandmother, Catherine, uh, my grandmother who would take me to the grocery store and buy me ice cream and uh, put Band-Aids on my knees, that grandmother, not generations, generations before, but she was born in 1918. Um, so of course, mm -hmm. uh, women's suffrage um, happened in 1920, but because she was born Native American, she wasn't considered a US citizen until 1924. Mm -hmm. um, and actually because she lived in Arizona, she didn't have the right to register to vote until uh, two World War II veterans came back from the war, uh, Native veterans, they tried to register they were denied. They sued the state of Arizona. And when my grandmother was 30 years old, did she finally have the ability to register to vote? Uh, but it didn't mean, of course, as we know, it didn't mean that she had the protection uh, to, to actually participate. She could be subject to um, any type of discrimination or intimidation turned away um, at, at the ballot box. Um, and so it wasn't until protest the fight, a civil rights movement paved the way for the Voting Rights Act of 1965. How about in Khuribat, be smart, Kurgan Yok, 
So even though she had her rights protected in 1965, my grandmother didn't speak English. And so it wasn't until um, 1975 that, that there were um, uh, translation protections um, for her. Um, and so when we talk about um, the starting line and where people are, mm -hmm. I recognize that we aren't all on the same starting line. Uh, but my grandmother, um, when I was a kid, uh, I grew up in a really rural area on the reservation. And so you can kind of drive there. Like the police maybe won't notice if you're cruising your grandma at 20 miles an hour to go to the grocery store or whatever. Um, and I remember taking her um, to go vote. And I remember having to you know, brush her hair and pin her hair up and walk her to the car using her walker and fold that up and drive very slowly down the dirt roads to go vote. And it was a whole ordeal. And when we came back, I remember she had wood paneling on her wall and she would take off her I voted sticker and she would just put it right up on the wall um, and would breathe a sigh of relief and she talked about having to fight for that right in her lifetime. And so I drew, I always draw on her strength. So beautiful. Vice Mayor Kim, close us out. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the biggest, I guess, female inspiration that I have, and not to sound really cliche, but it is my mom. Um, you know, my mom and all her, you know, imperfections and, and, and nagginess and everything, <laughs> um, you know, it, it's amazing all that she did coming here, you know, as an immigrant with little to no English skills, education, was abandoned by her husband here in this country with two small children, me and my brother, um, and despite that, sponsored her entire family to come here to this country, um, thereby changing the trajectory of an entire generation of our family. Um, and what that actually meant, despite, and it, I learned what sacrifice meant. I learned um, what it means. Serve and to take care of one's family, and in today, uh, when we talk about you know what I work for and what I strive for, things such as uh, language, you know, ensuring proper language access to services. Um, I don't even know how my mom was able to navigate through all that she navigated through with little skills. So I really always put myself in her shoes um, in understanding how do you access government programs? How do you access voting? How do you do anything? Um, and so that's why I fight so hard for things such as, you know, language access and making sure that, um, you know, different communities are able to know what we have available, what your rights are. She didn't even know what her rights were. Um, she thought my, by me being political meant that I might get arrested and go to jail like they did back in Korea. Um, and so, you know, just allowing, allowing me to be here, you know, with essentially the privilege that, that I have of being able to speak English, you know, even just the smallest things um, and seeing things in, in her, from her perspective, I think has made me, um, you know, a better community leader, a stronger elected official, and now, uh, you know, uh, just a stronger citizen of this world, so. My mom always thinks I like have negative things to say about her, <laughs> but that's the secret truth. It's my mom. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Vice Mayor Tammy Kim of Irvine, California, Council Member Julia Mejia of the Boston City Council, 
Pima County Recorder, Gabriela Cazares Kelly of Arizona, and Virginia Delicate Danica Rome. I'm just honored to call all of you Emerge Sisters. Thank you for being you. Thank you for everything you do every day, not only for your communities, but to lift up this entire nation. And I hope you all have enjoyed this conversation. You can stay up to date with us at EmergeAmerica.org, our website. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Emerge America. And we also have a YouTube channel where you can watch this conversation again because it was fabulous, but also our other conversations with amazing women in the Emerge Network. I hope everyone has had a great Women's History Month and I'll see you next time. Bye everyone.